good to see you this morning, and I really believe God has a special word for us today, an important word, and we're going to talk about a subject that I hear about probably more than just about any subject as a pastor, and we're going to just jump in and attack this question. In fact, I've entitled the message, Is Jesus the Only Way to Heaven? And I hear from, hear about this. Pastor, what is the story on this? I hear from Christians, non-Christians, people of other faiths. And so we're going to see what the Bible has to say this morning. But before we do, I want you to do something important for me. Would you turn to your neighbor and say this? I want you to say, I'm glad to be here. More than in the best ICU unit in Boca. <laughs> Amen. How many agree with that? You'd rather be here than the... My pastor uh, growing up used to say that all the time. How many would rather be here in church than in the best, finest IC unit, ICU unit? And uh, well, we're glad you're here this morning. And we're going to jump right in. We're actually starting a two-message uh, series on John chapter 14, and this is going to be kind of part one. Uh, this is a very, very important passage, probably the most uh, outlandish thing Jesus ever said. And uh, so look with me at, at John chapter 14, verse 6. It says this, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, it is true. Lord, it guides and directs us. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, you would anoint your servant. Father, I thank you for your love, your mercy. It's new every morning. Lord, you don't give up on us, even when we blow it or might do things that, Father, would be displeasing to you. You nevertheless love us. And Father, I just pray that you would touch each and every person this morning in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. If you were to ask just the average person on the street uh, what they thought about this important question, if you were to ask them, do you believe in heaven? Well, statistics say 73 out of 100 people would say, I believe in heaven. That's almost three out of every four people. It's amazing. That's what they would say. Now, if you were to dig and pry a little deeper and ask the question, do you believe you are going to heaven? Well, statisticians say that six out of every 10 people say that they believe they are going to heaven. Now, if you were to, you know, tighten the bolt a little bit more and get a little bit deeper and you were to ask the question, how many of you believe, how many of you believe, or how would you get to heaven? Well, the, uh, there are so many different answers that would fly up. It'd be like a covey of quail taken off, going many different directions. There are so many opinions on how does one get to heaven? And so we're going to be looking at this subject on heaven. Is, is Jesus the true direction? Is he the only way? When asked this question on how does one get to heaven, uh, in the, stat, uh, stat, uh, statistician, uh, the statisticians say this, thank you, <clears throat> that 50% of the people say this about how to get to heaven. Well, if you're good, or if you do good enough deeds, then you might earn your way to heaven. And in this 
multiple question survey, they some about 63% of the people said this. They said, well, you know, you can believe anything you want to believe as long as you have faith and you're sincere about that faith, 63%. Kind of brought that up in, in the, the multiple survey. The one that really caught me in reading the survey was, was this. There are some that even said 40% said that you don't even have to believe in God to go to heaven. Well, that's, it's hard for me as a pastor to get my mind around that. It's like saying, you know, I believe in Disney World, but I don't believe there was a Walt Disney. <laughs> you know? And so we're going to look at probably the most politically incorrect, blood pressure raising, uh, the most egregious type of statement that Jesus ever made in his ministry. Now, many of you know, a number of years ago, I was able to drive for uh, part-time for uh, an eye doctor, Dr. Alan Aker, who is an incredible Christian. What I loved about working with him, and we talked quite a bit uh, about some of the, in fact, I've been keeping record of a number of these things I've, I've got because I want to write a book about this experience because it's amazing the different things that people said to me while I was driving. I'm just, they didn't know quite often I was a pastor. They just thought I was a driver. I imagine, I imagine taxi cab drivers hear a lot too. Well, I, I heard a lot from different people. In fact, one particular woman told me, she said, do you know what that man did to me? And I said, eye surgery? You know, just kind of made sense to me. No. I said, well, what did he do to you? That man prayed for me. <laughs> oh. I said, well, what's wrong with that? I'm Jewish. Well, what's wrong with that? And then she paused. Her voice changed a little bit. And she said something that's always stuck with me. I told Dr. Aker this, and it touched him deeply. She said this. She said, it was the first time anyone ever prayed for me. Wow. Wow. It just touched my heart. I, I, I've picked up all kinds of people to get eye surgery, get cataracts taken out. Uh, in fact, Cliff just had some cataract surgery. He says now he can sometimes see the hockey puck in watching hockey. So if you can't see the hockey puck, maybe you need eye surgery. <clears throat> but I picked up one lady, and she was so exuberant. She was a nice uh, lady who all she could talk about was spirituality. She said, you know, I'm a Christian, and I just am so excited about spiritual things. I said, well, that's great. In fact, we picked up some other people in the van and she started talking more about, you know, in fact, she announced to the whole van, she said, you know, I want all of you to know that all religion is basically the same. When you peel back the layers of the different religions, they really kind of say the same thing. And what's wonderful is love kind of ties all of these religions together. And so religion doesn't matter what you believe. Religion is really all the same. And she kept saying that. And finally, I had to put on my pastor hat. And I said, excuse me, I don't know if I really agree with that. Agree with what? I don't agree with what you said, that all religions are the same. She says, you don't? I said, no, what? You said you were a Christian? And I quoted Matthew 14, 6. I said, what do you think about this subject 
this statement that Jesus made when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Well, you can imagine that ignited a major discussion in our van about this outlandish thing that Jesus said. And in the course of that discussion, I, I made a couple of other comments. I, I said, you know, Jesus did say some major outlandish things. He, he made a comment like, you've got to lose your life to save it. Here's one that's really outlandish. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. It's better to give than to receive. That kind of cuts against our human nature. It just kind of rubs us the wrong way sometimes when we hear outlandish statements like this. And Jesus really put things on the line when he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Wow. She didn't like that. I thought she would give me a good... She, here's her response. She was a nice lady. I'm not saying anything about her, except she said, you know, the Bible really is outdated. She didn't know I was a pastor. She just was talking to me just like I was an average person, which I thought was wonderful. She said, yeah, the Bible collects a lot of dust on people's coffee tables. It really is irrelevant. In fact, don't you think it's a bit arrogant, bigoted, that Christians would believe that Jesus is the only way? Jesus is not the only way to heaven. I thought, wow, you know... The thought of fruit started going through my mind. You know, you will know them by their fruit. She said she was a Christian, but I, I just couldn't, it didn't ring clear with me. She was chasing things, and we're going to talk a little bit more about, because I've kind of used her conversation as the outline for the message this morning. And maybe you're here. And maybe this statement troubles you. In fact, I had a pastor say, boy, you know, I really wish Jesus hadn't said this in John 14, 6, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. I couldn't believe I was hearing a pastor say that. Uh, and maybe you're here today, and maybe this passage has troubled you. Uh, maybe as you've kind of looked at Christianity, or if you're watching online, wondering, boy, you know, this Christianity thing... Uh, it all sounds good, love your neighbor, but this thing about Jesus saying he's the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through him. That's kind of an impediment, kind of a roadblock. I, I don't know about that. Or maybe you're a Christian, like this lady said she was, but this statement has caused you to wince a little bit when People that you work with or in your community bring this up. Boy, isn't that a little outlandish, arrogant for Jesus to make such a statement? Well, I've been a, a, a pastor for, for over 40 years. I, it's hard to believe that. but And so I've looked at this issue quite a bit. And we're going to talk about this and we're going to answer these questions by what the Bible says. And I've come to a conclusion. Jesus was telling the truth. I've come to the conclusion that what he said wasn't arrogant. And actually, it was an expression of great compassion. And I believe the closer we study this statement that he made, the more we look at it, the more we're going to see that it actually makes sense. And so we're going to look at this single statement that so many people cringe at. And certainly our world despises this statement. 
Boy, you're such arrogant Christians. Well, let's look at why is this so controversial? We want to look at this. Well, I think it strikes at three of the great myths of Christianity, of what people think Christianity is all about. It, it comes against those myths. And, and certainly this uh, very nice lady that I picked up in the van was struggling with because of her concept of what she thought Christianity was all about. You know, what I've learned as a pastor is many people don't read the Bible. They might hold the Bible. They might know one or two verses like Psalm 23 or John 3, 16, but they don't know the Word of God or take the time to read the Word of God. And so this morning, we're going to take what this nice lady said, and we're going to look at, at these three different myths and see how this statement really strikes at the heart of what many people believe about Christianity, about a relationship with God, about Jesus Christ. Number one, well, aren't all religions essentially the same, Pastor? That's what she was saying. That's the first statement she not only made to me, but she was witnessing Boy, if I could get uh, people our, uh, that I know t- that love the Lord to witness like she was boldly, she was proclaiming that all religions really are basically the same thing. And so she was saying, it doesn't really matter what you believe. As long as you're sincere, all spiritual paths, in other words, lead up to the mountain of God in one way or another. And when you strip everything down to the essentials, they all teach the brotherhood and sisterhood of men and women and the universal fatherhood of God. That's what a lot of people in this world believe. Yet in this outlandish assertion, Jesus Christ boldly takes Christianity and he puts it in a whole separate class by itself. If the only real path to God is through Jesus, then the reality is this, that Christianity cannot be reconciled with any other religion. It can't. In fact, Acts 4, 12, Paul said this. This is an important verse. Uh, Jesus Paul's talking about Jesus. He said, salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Paul says, there's no other avenue. There's no other way. It's only through Jesus. And there's an important reason why. Now, The uniqueness of Christianity is rooted in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. He is unlike any other religious leader that has ever walked on this planet. I want you to see the difference between other religious leaders and what they say and what Jesus says. Notice what other religious leaders say. Follow me and I will show you how to find the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. Other religious leaders say, follow me and I'll show you the way to salvation. Jesus says, I am the way to eternal life. Other religious leaders say, follow me and I'll show you how you can become enlightened. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Other religious leaders say, follow me and I'll show you many doors that lead to God. Jesus says, I am the door. Other religious leaders say, follow me and I'll show you how you can find spiritual nourishment. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus said, so follow me. You see, there's a big difference. People try to harmonize and find commonality between the different religions of the world. But there's a drastic difference. And I hear this all the time. Well, what about all those other religions? 
They are vastly different, not even in the same class as Christianity. And I don't say that arrogantly. I say that as a matter of fact. And you're going to see why all the other religions of the world are vastly different from having a relationship with Jesus Christ. As I've studied world religions, and I've had many classes on different religions, what I found is that all religions other than Christianity are basically based on the idea of people doing something, striving to somehow earn God's favor and God's blessing. You've got to do this or do that. It might be a Tibetan prayer wheel, or it might be some pilgrimage that you've got to go to once a year. It might be abstaining from some type of food that you cannot eat, or it may be pray in a certain way, or go through some series of reincarnation before you obtain enlightenment. And it goes on and on and on, just to mention a few that other world religions are saying, you've got to do before you will know God. They are all attempts of people to reach out to God. But Jesus Christ is God's attempt to reach out to people. Jesus taught the opposite what all these other world religions talk, and I'm talking about every single world religion. He said that nobody can earn their way to heaven. In, in fact, Jesus said, no one is good. In fact, he was saying this to the, you know, the, the Sanhedrin, people uh, that are part of the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And here is the epitome of man's righteousness. I, they're wearing these beautiful robes. They don't even touch Gentiles. They're, they are an example of, of the best that man can accomplish. And Jesus says this. He said, your righteousness is as filthy rags. It's like a dirty tampon. Now, he wasn't saying that strictly toward Jewish people. He was saying this for all of us to hear. In fact, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. No one is good except God, the Father. Hello? Hello? Everybody tracking with me? No one is good. So no one can say that they are good. In fact, this is why Jesus Christ came. This is what sets Christianity different from every other religion, because you can never do enough to earn your way to heaven. Jesus Christ has done what we could never do. It's done. A few weeks ago, we talked about that word tetelesta. When Jesus died and breathed his last, he said, it is finished. It is paid in full. Jesus Christ did for us what we couldn't do. When other religions say, well, you've got to do this, 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 and this, Jesus already did. So all we have to do is receive what he has already done. Well, the lady told me that although she was a Christian, she liked to go to the Buddhist temple. And, and I, I, I wrote this down after she said this, after I let her out. She said, and I quote, when I go into the Buddhist temple, I pray a little prayer to Jesus and I say, you're still my main man. <laughs> like, that's going to make things better or something. I don't. I told her, I said, you know, Buddhists aren't really sure if God even exists. If you study what Buddhists believe, they're not really sure if there is a God. Now, they have a lot of neat little sayings that you can read about 
They're all about good works. In fact, the Buddhists have a a story much like ours. You know, we you've heard me preach sermons on the prodigal son, and, and the son comes to the father and he says, you know. Dad, I wish you were dead, but since you're not dead, can you just go ahead and give me my inheritance right now? And the father said, okay, son. And he, he divvied up half of his inheritance and gave it to the son. Well, the Buddhists have a story just like that, uh, like the prodigal son, same type of scenario. These two stories start out the same. The, the young man goes into a foreign land and he fritters away all of the resources that he's received uh, uh, from the father until the, he reaches the place where he's in a pig pen. And he says, you know, I had it much better back at my father's house. I'm going to go back to him. And just like the Christian version the Buddhists have the same type of story. They go back to the Father. But where the difference takes place is this. With the Buddhist young man coming back to his father, his father requires that he works off the debt. And so many years he's in servitude in his very own home, working off the debt. But in the version that Jesus shares, the father has open arms and embraces the son and has a party and celebrates that his son who once was dead is now alive again. And you see a picture of grace and you see a picture of mercy and you see a picture of God's love extended really, to you and I as well. I think it's a, a powerful difference because in world religions, you've got to earn your way to heaven. You've got to pay for it yourself. But in Christianity, what separates us from every single world religion is that Jesus has already paid the price. In fact, God came to earth. That's what we celebrate Christmas. It's not about gifts, not about singing carols and eating great food and all of that's fun. Why do we celebrate Christmas? It's because of the incarnation that God became flesh, clothed himself in flesh and became one of us and dwelt among us. That's what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel means and God is with us and God himself came to show us the way. Show how much he loved you and me. Amen? Christianity says there's one God eternally existing in three persons, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Hinduism says everything is God. In fact, this lady was telling me that she believed that rocks and trees were God. And I said, you know that, you got to be careful I said, in Romans, you're a Christian, right? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, in Romans, Paul said that we have to be careful because many heathen worship the creation instead of the creator. That's right. So you know the Bible. In Hinduism, they say everything's God. Islam denies that Jesus is God. Islam denies Jesus died on the cross for our sins. As I mentioned earlier, Buddha was noncommittal about the idea of God. So you can see that these beliefs are at odds with each other. They can't all be true. They contradict one another. So all religions are not basically the same. Other religious leaders can offer... Some cute little sayings. They can get people to follow them. But Jesus Christ is the only one qualified to offer himself as a payment, as a sacrifice for our sins because he lived a perfect life. And he came and lived that life perfectly, without sin. 
The myth number two, I'm going to, these next two myths are going to go a little quicker on. Myth number two, all religions have equal claims on the truth. Well, with all these other religions out there, don't, you know, how do you know which one's true? And in fact, all of them say they're true, right? All of them say, hey, we, we have divine insight. Well, they all can't be true. I mean, just common sense tells us that everyone can't be true. But there's an equal claim on the truth. They say, well, you have your truth, and we've got our truth. And so they both claim equally to be true. And listen, just think about that. It can't be. This has a certain amount of appeal in the U.S., and let me tell you why. Because we live in a tolerant, pluralistic society. Our Constitution, listen to me, protects the right of any human being to believe whatever they want to believe. It does. It protects us. But some people make an erroneous assumption. Well, because the laws of our country protect every belief, therefore every belief must be equally true. Nee. Wrong. <clears throat> and the Supreme Court has talked about that what we have in this country is a marketplace of ideas. Yeah, your, your ideas, all of our ideas are protected. You can believe whatever you want. And their opinion is, and I'm just going to put this in a nutshell, that truth and falsehood kind of grapple wrestle it out until the in the end the truth will emerge it's kind of how the supreme court looks at it so just because all religions are equally protected does not mean that all religions are equally true are you following me on that That means in this country where uh, we can believe whatever we want to believe. Now, I want to bring up something that's very interesting that you may not realize. There have been a number of people, even in our country, that have claimed what Jesus claims, that they are the way, the truth, and the life. And that if you'll believe in them, they're the way to God, to heaven. I think one of my favorites is in 1872, a lady by the name of, uh, I want to get this right, Jemima Wilkinson, I'm sorry, 1752, a woman born in 1752. Her name was Jemima Wilkinson. She was born in Rhode Island. She had 200 people following her. She said she was the daughter of God and that she was your ticket to heaven. She was, and made the same statement Jesus made, that she was the way, the truth, and the life. You may not realize that. She also claimed that she could walk on water and that she would rise from the dead. Well, she didn't. She's still in the grave today. And her followers disbanded. But how? listen to me. Then how do we know that Jesus was telling the truth? Anybody could say this, couldn't they? Well, how do we know that Jesus was telling the truth? The reality is this. Only Jesus backed up his claims with unique credentials and gave him unique credibility, which gave him cred uh, uh, unique credibility, excuse me. Jesus had lots of credentials. I'm just going to give you four real quick. The first one you've heard me uh, express on a number of occasions, and you'll probably hear me in the future because I think this is powerful. Number one and number four are my two favorites, but I'm going to give you four real quick. Jesus validates his claim by fulfilling multiple prophecies. Jesus Christ is the only one in human history that has fulfilled 300 prophecies in one lifetime. All these ancient prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Sixty major prophecies, like what? Where he was going to be born? Uh, what city he was going to be born in? Uh, 
what he would do, where he would go, what he would say. We have all these prophecies, and Jesus Christ fulfilled every one to the letter, all 300, many of them smaller ones, but 60 major prophecies, only one in human history to do such. Now, Dr. Stoner of the American Scientific Affiliation, they, they did a probability uh, uh, study, and that if eight prophecies were fulfilled by one man in one lifetime, it would be the probability would be one in 10 to the 17th power. Josh McDowell puts this in, in a greater sense in his book. Um, I, it slips me, but I can get you the name of it later. But uh, he expounds upon this at length. And, and one of the things that Josh McDowell says that to give you an idea of the probability of 10 to the, that's 10 with 17 zeros behind it. That would be, if you had a silver dollar for everyone, it would cover the entire state of Texas. Three feet high. And if one of those silver dollars was painted red, and you sent somebody blindfolded across the state of Texas, and you said, just at any point, you can stop, I'd probably take one step and stop. <laughs> Bend over and pick up, and you pick up, that red silver dollar, that's the same probability percentage that you would have if you were one man in one lifetime fulfilled eight prophecies. Jesus fulfilled 60 and 300 all together. That ought to be an eye opener to somebody. Hello? The second thing, that I want you to see is he validates his claim by his unprecedented character. Usually when you're around somebody, you see all of their faults and failures and sins and ugliness. Hello? My, my wife's writing a book on me, all the, <laughs> all the negatives. She's going to make a fortune. It's just going to be such a big book, though. I don't know if people will read it. But did you know Peter and John closest to Jesus? I want you to notice what they said. They were with him the whole time, all the way up into the crucifixion. John said, 1 John 3, 5, in him is no sin. Talk about uh, an impeccable character. Peter said he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. Wow. Can you even say that about your best friend or your spouse or, or a son or daughter? No, we, we all have sinned, haven't we? The third thing that, that gives Jesus credentials about being who he said he was is, number three, he validated his claim by performing miracles. And we don't have time to go through the many, many miracles. In fact, John said, when we were studying the book of John, John said uh, that there would not be enough volumes to encase all of the miracles that Jesus did. But in John 10, 37, he said this, and Jesus is speaking, he says, don't you even believe me unless I do miracles of God? In other words, the miracles, and he did many, showcase that he was the Messiah, who he said he was. The fourth thing that I want us to look at in this weekend, this is kind of what we're celebrating a little bit, is that Jesus fulfilled his own prediction. Three days after he was put to death, he was resurrected from the dead. Jesus said it beforehand. He said, you can tear down this temple, but in three days I will raise it up. Jesus said that. I had a Jehovah Witness come to my door, and usually when they come and ring our doorbell, I hear this, Dad, Dad, someone's here to see you. Yeah, what is it, son? 
uh, Jehovah Witness is here or Mormon is here. But anyway, so I go to the door and, and I like to talk with them. And one of the things that you can say to Jehovah Witnesses if you engage them is you can share your testimony. Who can argue with your testimony? And so that's something very important. That's a different subject. But anyway, they, they came and they tried to trip me up. They said, who raised Jesus from the dead? Well, I said, uh, well, that's a good question. And I said, well, God raised Jesus from the dead. That's just kind of my first answer. I said, we find that in the book of Acts. And they said, well, you're right. See, God raised Jesus. So Jesus isn't God. You're worshiping three gods. I said, no, I'm not. Because the Bible also says, uh, and I quoted that verse, Jesus said, tear down this temple and I'll raise it in three days. And the next verse explains that he was talking about his death and resurrection. I said, so God raised him from the dead. Jesus raised himself from the dead. And let me add one, the Holy Spirit. The same power that dwells in you raised Christ Jesus from the dead. They're like, well, um, well, we'll be seeing you. <laughs> they just left so fast. So Christians believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy We believe in one God, just one God. Simplified in three persons, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So don't let them Jehovah Witnesses beat up on you. They're wonderful people. We love them. We need to pray for them. They just, their theology is a little off, right? So let's pray for them. Amen? But Jesus was resurrected from the de dead. Acts 2, 22 talks of Peter's talking as well. Jesus of Nazareth was the man whose divine mission was clearly shown to you by the miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him. And it goes on to say that he was resurrected from the dead. 3,000 came to know him. I know I'm kind of rushing through this, but more than 500 witnesses saw Jesus alive after the crucifixion. The third myth I'm trying to get to real quickly because I know we're out of time. The final myth is, is this. I'm going to ask Byron to come to the piano, and I'm probably going to go through this fairly quickly. Number one, Chris, or, or myth number three, excuse me. Christians are arrogant when they say that Jesus is the only way to heaven. I, I've heard that on TV. I've heard that from newscasters. That, uh, I, I've heard it from all kinds of people. That Boy, Christians are so narrow-minded to believe that the only way to God is through Jesus? Are you kidding me? How arrogant. Well, we have to look at the evidence. In fact, I would agree that if Christians were being, were being arrogant, if there were many ways to get to heaven, and they were just kind of saying, look, ours is the best way. Christians are not saying that. Listen to me, church. Christians are saying that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. And if you're listening by radio or if you're whistling, listening online, I want to declare to you that Jesus Christ is absolutely the only way to heaven. There's no other way. And let me tell you why. He is the only one qualified to become a sacrifice, to pay for our guilt. The wages of sin is death. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No other religion has anyone that has sacrificed himself, much less God coming from heaven in the form of a child for a purpose to become an ultimate sacrifice for you to take your place, only Christ. 
Only Christ has done it. Christ did what we cannot do. You can't be good enough. You're not good enough. There's not a perfect person in this world, period, or in this room. Point to someone that's perfect. Okay? Only Jesus. That's why Jesus said no one is good, but God the Father. Well, that's pretty arrogant. You know, a few years ago, some friends of ours, um, well, it's been, I say a few years ago, it's been, man, it's probably been close to 30 years. My wife will know. Brian Rago is a good friend of mine. We worked together in recording studio in Springfield, Missouri at the Assemblies of God headquarters there. And it was a wonderful season of our lives. And we had kids there. Well, he had a, a child. And he, he told me that um, I want to say his daughter, I, I may, I don't remember exactly, but it's, well, I'm at least 50% right, right? It's a son or a daughter. I don't know which one. He had both. Had jaundice. And so the doctor said, you know, there's a real simple cure for jaundice. You've got to put the child under a special light. And when you do, it will cause the liver to begin to activate and they'll no longer be jaundice. Today, it's, it's not a major deal, is it? But back a long time ago, it could take the life of a child. It could be very serious. But what if, now my, my good friend Brian Rago didn't do this, but what if he said, no doctor, I, I have another way. I'm just gonna get some soap and bleach and I'm just gonna scrub her little arms and legs until that yellowness goes away. The doctor would say, well, hey, you, you don't understand, I'm a doctor. I have the credentials. You need to do what I say, and there's only one way to cure jaundice. Only one way. And that's put her under a special light. Well, you know, okay, I won't get the soap or bleach, but I'm just going to believe, you know, that, you know, we're just going to kind of ignore it. And I'm just going to believe that that's going to heal her. No, you don't understand, Brian. If you do that, your daughter could die. There's only one way to cure jaundice, and that's to put that girl under a special light to get that liver to activate. I'm a doctor. See the credentials on my wall? There's not a single person in this place or this world that would say, boy, you're that doctor so arrogant that He's saying there's only one way to cure jaundice. It doesn't even cross our mind, does it? And that's why I said earlier, Jesus is really showing us compassion. When he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. There's only one way to cure sin. And that's as a result of the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. God has made a way. There's only one way. You can't earn your way. You can't ignore it. You can't say there's another way. There's only one way. And God has provided that way. That whosoever believes on me should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yeah, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. But he also, there's another verse that's even on steroids. Kind of like that verse, but on steroids. And he said this, and even some of his followers left him. Here's what he said. Unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, 
you'll not experience the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Was he saying we become cannibals? No. Not what he was trying to say. He's saying, look, Jesus Christ is the only way. You can't earn your way to heaven. If you're trying to earn your way to heaven by being good, stop. Jesus says you can't be good enough. It's a hopeless cause to try to do that. And all these myriads of things that you have to do to, to reach nirvana, it's a waste of time. Why am I saying this? To be mean? To be arrogant? And I'm trying to tell you the truth. Yeah, there are people who aren't going to listen to what I'm saying or what other pastors say. Those who love God and preach about Christ, but we still preach it nonetheless. Because there's no other name under heaven by which men and women can be saved except through Jesus. Period. Well, what about all these other millions and millions and millions of religions? Don't even think about them. It's the enemy trying to get you on a slippery slope that will take you far from God. Hello? Father, thank you for this message. Lord, may it just take a, just grip us in our heart. Lord, your love for us is so different from every other man-made type of religion. Father, you came yourself. You delivered the message yourself that you love us with an everlasting love. Lord, help us just to, to be your mouth, to be your arms and legs, to reach our friends and neighbors with this very important message that, Lord, you're the way, you're the truth, and you're the life. You came that we might experience life and life to the full, life abundantly. Lord, why do we chase other things? Lord, help us to become obsessed with you, Lord. You are our Lord and Savior. Father, touch your people. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed, just a couple of things I want to ask. You're here this morning, and maybe you've never invited the person that loves you more than anything else. Jesus. Maybe you've never invited Jesus to come and live in your heart, to be with you, to guide you, to direct you. This morning you can, on this Palm Sunday. You'd say, Pastor, that's me. No one looking around, but you'd raise your hand and say, remember me in prayer. Write up, write down, real quickly. God says, yes. Just write up, write down. We just tarry just a moment. God knows, God sees. The second thing before we close in prayer is this. It's a pastor. I got away from God. I've started chasing things in this world. I've gotten, my relationship is not where it should be. Made a lot of poor choices. Done a lot of poor things. God's love for you never changes. You'd say, remember me in prayer. Right up, right down real quickly. God sees, yes, yes. Yes. God sees. Thank you. Hallelujah. I want you just to repeat after me this prayer. If you're a Christian, you've said this before, but it's just a prayer of rededication. And if you raise your hand and said, I'm not sure if things in my heart are right with God, I want you to just say this as, as your prayer to the Lord. But would everyone pray this prayer with me? Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. 
I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Thank you for dying on a cross and becoming a sacrifice to pay for my sin in full. And you rose again so that I might live life abundantly and to the full. From this day forward, I make a commitment to live for you all my days as you give me strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, I just pray over this congregation. And Lord, I know that there are many people that are in their sphere of influence, family, people they work with, people they meet, they associate with, even people at the grocery store, different places that they've come to know. Father, help us to be able to share our testimony. Lord, of your love, and make a difference in our world. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen.